This program is made possible by the friends and partners of Unspeakable Joy TV. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But in Exodus chapter 14, the Spirit of God gave me this verse yesterday. I was talking to a preacher, a friend of mine, and he called and was asking for something. I was giving him my thoughts and my advice and take that for what it is. The Spirit of God brought this verse to my mind and I, I said it to him. And God began to really, really build it. And this morning I was in the office after praying and this verse came to me again. In Exodus chapter 14, verse number 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Watch verse number 14. God, how can you say that? How can you say this is never going to bother us ever again? Verse number 14, the Lord shall fight for you. And in the midst of all of that, God, I love that. What am I supposed to do? And ye shall hold your peace. When you come to Exodus chapter number 14, the Jewish people are in between the ninth plague and the tenth plague upon Egypt. The ninth plague was that plague of utter darkness, absolute bleakness and blackness in the nation of Egypt. God had taken the light, taken the sun, and had turned it around and blackened the entire sky. I have no idea how that happened. All I know is the Bible says that I believe it. And it goes dark and it goes black, and yet... God never, here's the point, God never gives a chance for Pharaoh to let the people go. You see, you can reach a point with God where God does not give you an opportunity anymore to do business with him. How do you know when that point is? Here's when it is. When God turns the light out on your desire to seek after God. When you finally arrive at that place where you no longer care to hear the word of God, you care to hear the preaching of God, you care to hear. When you have been under conviction and now you've reached that point where God is no longer real to you, you no longer care about him, I'm telling you, God has turned the light out on you. He will not give you a chance anymore because ultimately what's happened is God has hardened the heart of Pharaoh to the point where the only way God's going to do business with it is shattering it into a thousand pieces. And if you're here this morning and there is an inkling, I mean just an inkling of spiritual acuity in your mind and you're thinking about God or you're processing God and you're trying to ponder this thing of God, you better throw in with God as fast as you can because you have no idea when God is going to turn the lights out and it's all going to be over with in your ability to go after God. And here comes Moses and he says, Lord, you turned out the lights, but yet Pharaoh 
angel's not letting us go. What are we going to do? And God tells Moses this. He says, I'm going to send the plague of all plagues. I'm going to send the mother of all destructions. And it is going to be the death of every first born in all of Egypt. Now, this is where we often miss it. It was not just the firstborn of the family. It was the firstborn of the flock. It was everything that had been firstborn. You say, well, why would that matter? Because watch this. What were they to do with the firstborn lamb of the flock on that Passover night? They were to take the firstborn of the flock thrust the knife into its throat and shed the blood. This is what you have to understand. God was going to get the firstborn one way or another. That's what you have to realize in this thing called life. You are going to bow before the Lord Jesus Christ one way or another. You're either going to do it willingly in this life and enjoy the fruit of peace and grace and mercy or you're going to do it willingly in the next life but you will have nothing but death hell and destruction and so God is going to get his pound of flesh one way or another and I mean Moses looks at him and he says God how in the world how in the world am I going to be able to get these people out after you kill Pharaoh's kids after you slay all their animals he is really going to come after me. What am I going to do? God looks at Moses and gives him verse number 13 and verse number 14. He says, Moses, fear ye not. Do not be afraid. I'm telling you today, you may be up against the greatest catastrophe of your life. I have no idea what the people in this room and the people online are watching that are watching our deal. I have no idea what your family's going through. I have no idea about the anxiety that you're going through. But I do know this. I do know that many of you are probably up against the greatest hurdle and greatest obstacle and greatest fear-mongering in your mind that you have ever been up against and the devil is racking you and the enemy is fighting you and your mind is overwhelming you and you came into church today and you probably didn't really come to church today because you felt like it. You probably came today because of one of two reasons. Number one, because you knew that's what you were supposed to do. Or number two, maybe, just maybe, somebody would sing something or say something that would encourage my weary and broken and fearful heart. So here's what I've got to tell you today. The good God of eternity has sent a little preacher your way to let you know that he has not forgotten about you. He has not thrown in the towel on you. There is still hope and he looks at you and he says, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You say, what in the world does that mean? And why are you telling? Well, there are two things today that you're going to see. The first thing you're going to see is what you are supposed to do. And the second thing that you're going to see is what God is going to do. So let's look in verse number 13 at what you are supposed to do. Now, I know everybody wants a how-to message. Everybody wants a step-by-step -step process of how they're supposed to live their life. We want step-by-step -step on how to open our phone. We want step-by-step -step on how to program our stuff. We want step-by-step -step in how to do this and do that. I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step in what you're supposed to do in this day when God says, fear not. Here we go. Number one, look in verse number 13. The first thing you are to do is to fear not. Notice what it says in verse number 13. The first thing that Moses says to the people is to fear not. Now, brothers and sisters, how many of you know? Now, don't you act like some dead Baptist this morning who's sitting on your hands waiting on lunch to come. Help me now and preach with me. How many of you know that fear is a real palpable, truly inside of you, can feel it with every fiber of your being, you can know it's real. Sure you can. People over here are not with me. People over here have no idea they're in church, and I don't know what y'all are doing back there. Here's what I'm telling you. It is a real palpable feeling. You know, y'all look at me, and I know what y'all are thinking. What a hunk dude. 
Well, used to think that. Really, now I'm a chunk dude. But, you know, I'm, I, one way or the other. Man, you know, I know you're looking at me thinking, I bet he could fight. Well, I know contrary to popular belief, I'm not a fighter. Bitch, stop shaking your head and be quiet. I, I, I've never been a fighter. I don't, I, I've always been able to talk my way out of fights. Now, y'all do believe that, don't you? Yeah. Son, I've always been able to politic my way out of a good fight. And I'm going to tell you what I could do when I was a boy. I could talk somebody else into fighting somebody else. I mean, I'd say stuff. They're talking about your mama. They're saying your granny can't cook. Your daddy's ugly. I mean, I, I could get it going. You know, I used to have, I've never been the biggest of people. I, I'm just an average height, average weight. I'm just an average guy. But you know, I had the wise, wise bone in my body. I had, and I don't know what it is about me, but people either love me or they, they really do. They hate me. I'm honest. I tell my wife all the time, I have, I have no idea why. I am the nicest. I'm one of the best friends you'll ever have. I'm loyal. Honest, I'm a St. Bernard. That's what I am. I just thought about that. I am a St. Bernard. I'm loyal. If you come against somebody I love, I will cut you. I mean, I'm, I'm just that kind of guy. I had these guys in school. I'm going to tell you something. They were huge. They were big. And I mean, for some reason, my person had a target for them. And you know, they would say stuff like this. They would say stuff like, you wait till we get out of school on a school bus. I'm going to knock you out. Now, I know kids today have no idea what that means. So if you youngins today want to know what that means, LOL, BBB, boo, 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 whatever that means, that's what it means then. Man, it would, and they would always tell it to me at lunch. Always. You know what that meant? From lunch to the bus. I was in sheer terror and how many of you remember that feeling in school i'm telling you and i'm i'm just saying i used to think what can i do to get out of this i couldn't run from it i couldn't shake it out of my head it was real the only thing that ever brought me peace was i realized at the beginning of the school year there was a new kid that came in my class. And nobody really wanted to have anything to do with JB. But JB was huge. I'm not talking, I'm not talking like to eat huge. I'm talking lift Volkswagen huge. And nobody else would talk to JB. But I knew there might be a day when old TCG would need JB. So I made nice with old JB. And I told JB, I said, pal, if you ever need anything, you let me know. Nobody really liked being around JB. But I'm telling you, JB was the biggest boy in fifth grade. JB was the biggest kid around. He was bigger than all the bullies. He was bigger than all the means. He was bigger than all the people. He was bigger than everybody else. Hey, you know what I had to do? All I had to do when old boogers were trying to get me on the school bus, old JB rode TCG school bus. And I tell JB after we go to the out to PE. I said, JB, they were messing with me and they're telling me they're going to whip me on the bus. JB, JB, look at me and he'd tell me no tooth, didn't have a tooth in the front of his head. He had a little list coming through his little teeth. He'd say, he'd say, T, he'd say, T, he'd say, don't worry about that. I'll be on the bus and in order to get to you, they're going to have to go through me. And here's what happened. The problem did not change. The bigness of those guys eyes did not change. But do you know why I stopped fearing? Because I realized there was a new kid in the equation now. There was somebody that was bigger than them and somebody that was bigger than me. And it took all my anxiety away. It took all my fear away. It took all my torment away. And so you say, what am I supposed to do today? What you
you've got to understand today is there is somebody that's bigger than a Democrat and Republican. There is somebody bigger than a red, a white, and a blue. There's somebody bigger than black lives and white lives. There's somebody bigger than rich lives and poor lives. There's somebody bigger than COVID and flu and cold and sinus infection and stomach bugs and everything else. And when you realize that not one thing will come your way that has not first gone by your heavenly JB, you'll be okay and that fear will fade away. Not one thing happens in your life that was not orchestrated by the holy, powerful, sovereign God of eternity. You say, but I got sick. Then evidently, that was something that God saw fit to send. You know, I'm telling you today, I have no idea why things happen, but I rest in this fact. Not one thing happens that was not supposed to happen to the child of God that loves him. Explain that. I can't. If I had a God I had created, I would understand him. But I have a God that is transcendent above all things. I can't explain him. I just trust in him. So today, what you've got to understand, and I know everybody's afraid. I know there's real palpable fear in the house of God. I understand that. But what you've got to understand is that the God that you serve, as the problems got bigger, he didn't get smaller. He is what he's always been, and he's as big as he's always been. So to that, God says, fear ye not. Number two, whatever the problem is you're facing, Here's what you're supposed to do. Now, this is going to be a real barn burner right here. I can feel it. Because in this age of we love to be a part of the solution, here's what God tells you to do. He says, fear ye not, number two. Stand still. Oh, now we love saying amen to that. But living it is a lot different. Am I right about it? Sure I am. Tyler, this is what I desire for you. Lord, that sounds wonderful. What do you want me to do to bring it to pass? Nothing. All right, Lord. Now, when you say nothing, what do you mean by nothing? Now, Lord, I'm perfectly fine doing nothing. As long as nothing doesn't really mean nothing, I'll do nothing. But if nothing actually means something, then I'd love to do nothing as long as you'll let me do something. I don't have to be a big something, just a little something, just so you know that I trust you. And he says, stand still. Some of you have prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed over a matter. And something inside of you, it's an anxious feeling. It's a feeling that brings anxiety when you think about it. Every time you think about it, it brings anxiety. And it's telling you, well, maybe if you'll just do this, it'll speed up the process. Maybe if you'll just push this. I have found in my life when something tells me to do something that brings anxiety, it's never of God Almighty. If I am thinking about trusting God and I'm thinking about how to walk with God and I'm thinking about how to seek God and something hits me on the inside and tells me to do something and it brings me anxiety to do it, it's always the enemy. But yet when I'm in my apathy and I'm not thinking about anything and something hits me and shakes my nerves, that's always God. How many of you Or like my wife, and you're a fixer. Oh, yeah, every woman in the house raises their hands. They're a fixer. I'm not a fixer. He can go broke as a joke. It don't bother me. Everything can fall apart. I'm fine. Not my wife. Not my wife. And I may need a ride home today. Because I did something, my sister will take me home. I know she will. Right before church, my wife came into the office, and I'm in there trying to find God, and I'm trying to find the mind of God. And Darren, she comes running. This ain't going on TV, so don't think. I'm not putting this on the television for everybody to know me and you got marriage trouble, all right? Let's just stay here. Man, she comes running in. She comes, I mean, I I heard the little combination on the door, click, 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 and I heard it turn. 
And son, she came stepping in there with them nine-inch heels, and she came a-bouncing in there, Scott. And she said, did you know this and 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 this? And I looked at her. I said, what do you want me to do about it? I'm going to tell you what she did. That heel became a pivot. And son, she swung her around and walked right back out the door. You know why, Austin? Because I've come far enough in my journey where I realize the things I can do something about and the things I can't do something about. Now, when you get to the point where you actually think about that situation, and if you have to say this about that situation, well, if I do such and such and such and such, maybe this will happen. Stand still. Don't do a thing. What does it mean to stand still? I want you to think about moving and working and doing, and it's the opposite of that. What does it mean to stand still? I want you to think about putting your hands on it and don't do that. I want you to think about saying something to somebody and don't say anything to that person. I want you to think about making that phone call and then don't make it. I want you to think about going to that place and then don't go there. Because what stand still is, it's the opposite of everything you want to do that thinks it'll make it happen. He says, stand still, fear not. You ready for this third one? You ready? And see. See. Here's what God says to you that are worried about whatever situation that is. And I understand this message isn't for everybody, but it's for somebody. Do you know what you have to do to see? Nothing. In order to see something come about, you know what you've got to do? Absolutely nothing. Now I want you to notice, and I saw this in my office right after me and my wife had a 1016. That's police jargon for domestic disturbance. (laughs) Watch what it says you'll see. It says you'll see the salvation of the... Now watch this. We often look at that and say, God, you're going to move that mountain. That's not what that word salvation means. That word salvation, circle it in your Bible, draw a line out to the side. It's the Hebrew word Yeshua. Yeshua. Y-E-S-H-U-A. He says, stand still, fear not, and you will see Yeshua. Do you know what the Greek word for Yeshua is? It's the Greek word Jesus. Can I help you with something? God's not interested in giving you deliverance. God's interested in showing you Jesus in the situation you're in. He's trying to show you how you can look like Jesus. He's trying to show you how you can react like Jesus. He's trying to show you how you can respond like Jesus. Here's what happens. Those things come up at work. And man, I used to preach these messages, brother. I'd get up and I'd preach these messages like this. And I'd say, I know that person at work is getting on your nerves. I know that person at work is driving you crazy. Thanks be unto God that can take that person and ship them to a new department. You see, that's the kind of deliverance we want. But I'm learning real Christianity is in that situation. Real salvation is when you learn to see Christ in the midst of chaos. That's real salvation. It's when you learn in the midst of panic and fear to stand stalwart. And say, it's going to be okay. Because God's in control. It's in the midst of the problem where you look and say, I don't have any idea either. But God is still in control. He says, when you stand still and you see the bigness of God, you will see Christ in the situation. You see, too many of us 
get so upset because God doesn't deliver us from the problem. Can I tell you something? In the Old Testament, the way that God showed His power was He delivered people out of problems. In the New Testament, the way He shows His power is He brings peace in the midst of problems. Because in the midst of chaos and confusion and all of the craziness of church, it would be nothing for a preacher to get up. And you and I both know this is true. It's nothing for a preacher to get up and look at somebody and say, you're healed in the name of Jesus. And some fake and phony say, I am healed. I am going to be okay. Cancer has gone away. But it's a different animal when somebody stands up and says, Looks like I'm going to die. Whether I live or whether I die, God is still good. Stand still and see Jesus in the situation. That's what you'll do. But you see, God's not in the process of just giving you spiritual hope. But spiritual hope yields physical hope. Because there's what God will do. Watch what it says he'll do. And I'm getting you down to the very last moment. I'm getting you down to this very last second here. Watch what it says God will do. He will do three things. Number one, verse number 13. It says, he will show you today. That word show, it doesn't mean to put on display. You know what it means? It means he'll unveil. You know, I never, ever doubt trusting God when I understand what he's doing. I've never doubted God when I see what he's doing. It's when I have no clue what he's doing. Those are the biggest struggles. And God says this. He says, when you fear not and you stand still and you begin to look for Jesus in every situation, He says, now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start to unveil to you. I'm going to start to show you today. What does today mean? Does today mean tomorrow? Does today mean yesterday? What does today mean? It means what? Thank you. It means today. And this is what God promises. If you will fear not and if you will stand still and you will begin hunting Jesus in the situation that you're in, he says, today I'll begin to show you. That's the first thing God says he'll do. The second thing he says he'll do is in verse number 14. It says, the Lord shall fight for you. You. God will move, God will work, and you won't have to worry about it. And I know what y'all are thinking, where are we going? What in the world are we working ourselves up to? We're working ourselves up to the third thing it says he'll do in verse 14. And ye, because of everything God does, ye shall hold your peace. That word, hold your peace, It literally means, Scott, you'll act like a deaf man. It's like you don't hear anything going around. Can I ask you a question? Have you been acting like that the last couple of weeks? Or have you let what you've heard shake you like a reed in the wind? He says, you'll act like a deaf man. Hold your peace. How about in that situation with that loved one that's not saved and you've been begging God, begging God, begging God and the devil tells you it's never going to happen and the next thing you know, it rises up inside of you and it's like it just overwhelms you and you just explode. The opposite of that is when he says, hold your peace. Now I'm going to let you all in on something. Scott, help me. I'm going to need all the help I can get right now. Susie, I've been married going into 13 years. 13 is the number of rebellion. I'm trying to beat that one. I've learned with my precious wife, unless y'all think that, I, that, that it's a one-sided deal, I promise you, 
I got the best end of that agreement there. That may be her one issue. I got one thing going for me. That, so don't, don't think I'm picking on her this morning. You know what I've learned the best way to deal with people and situations that I can tell you I can't do a thing about them. I can't do a thing with it. You know what I've learned? Act like I don't hear it. You act deaf to it. That's what it means to hold your peace. It doesn't even enter in. You say, where are you going with this? Watch this. Notice what it says. Act like you don't hear it. Don't use your ears. But that doesn't mean you don't see it. It doesn't mean you don't see it. And it also means you've got something else. You see, what happens is you don't let the fear mongering enter here, but you take it in here and it's a direct loop to pray about it. The reason so many of us have such a hard time holding our peace is because we refuse to pray about it as soon as it enters our eyesight. We mull it, we think about it, we process it, we ponder it, we chew it, we let it, we let it just build up inside of us, and ultimately it gets too big to come back out. Y'all always tell me the one thing you like about me is the fact I'm honest with you. So I'll be honest with you. I hate Mexican food. I detest Mexican food. I despise Mexican food. Do you know why I detest Mexican food? Because one time me and a few of the folks here at the church were eating after a marriage thing we had one night with Mike and Amy Edwards. I hate seafood. I hate all seafood. If it comes out of the ocean, it ain't going in the tube here. I hate it. I despise it. I, dis I disdain anything out of the ocean. I ordered a chicken taco. One chicken taco is all I wanted. I wasn't paying attention. I was running my mouth. I was talking. And I bit into that taco. And I started chewing. And I thought, that chicken is like chewy. And I swallowed it. And I thought, man, I'm like, my, I'm hurting. And because I'm a man, you know what I did? I, well, not yet, no, I picked it up and went in for another bite. And I bit into that taco again. And I realized immediately it wasn't chicken. It was shrimp. Now, I know that don't bother you seafood people. I'm telling you, it was earth-shattering in my life. You know what I did, Cheryl? I didn't look for a napkin. I didn't get up from the table. I didn't look for a bathroom. I realized that did not need to go down. So you know what I did right there? I let it come out like that. You know why? Because had that gone down, it could have been a real problem for me. You see, you've got to start treating your problems like that. Instead of chewing on them, and letting them get in your heart, and letting them get in your mind, and just mulling them and chewing on them and trying to figure out what you're going to do about them. As soon as it comes in, your eye gate, hold your peace and tell it to God. Thank you for watching this broadcast of Unspeakable Joy with Pastor Tyler Galden. Our prayer is that you have been challenged and changed by the power of God's Word. Unspeakable Joy is only able to broadcast on this station through the regular prayers and financial support of people just like you. We thank you for your faithful support. For more information, visit us online. To request the full sermon from this broadcast, call us at 833-FULL-JOY or write us at Unspeakable Joy. 
P.O. Box 4558, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27404. All of our sermons and other resources are available free of charge online. Be assured that God's Word has the answer for your every need, that you may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory.